run through of the Prezi, um, and I'll share this as a, a YouTube link, a screencast, a matic link. Uh, just gonna make that smaller again. Okay, um, so what I wanted to start out with this week was a sort of idea of how we get to the start of this course. Um, so if you um, you follow along with the YouTube link or you can listen to this recording and follow along with the Prezi, um, I'm going to go through each slide. Um, the beginning of the things that make this the modern period is the focus of this first lecture. So what differentiates this period from an early period, what makes this World History 2 and World History 1, um, is really this belief in the ability of humans to work out stuff rather than be told stuff from up on high. Um, this reliance on human reason, on the scientific method, on experimentation, on debate, to ascertain knowledge about the world um, and then to go ahead and change that world. So uh, the first thing that we're going to look at is the scientific revolution, right? Um, in 1543 we see Copernicus publishing and this is generally held to be the beginning of the scientific revolution. Um, and what happens there is there's a transition from thinking about things and having sort of revelation mentally to observing things um, and seeing what we learn from the evidence presented to us by empirical observation. Um, furthermore, we move from thinking, having this sort of what uh, Werewolf calls an unbounded reverence for the past. Uh, an unbounded reverence is sort of this this idea that if someone in the past had said something, unless we really can disprove it, then it's probably true. And we should show respect to these ideas that have come down to us through history. Uh, now there was this idea that mankind, through observation, through science, through reason, could make the world a better place. And this went from an idea that it was possible to an expectation very quickly. Um, so the most important invention that comes from this is the scientific method itself, which is to say doing experiments and learning from those experiments and then using those to generate more experiments which teach us more. Um, the basic scientific method, as I'm sure many of you know who are science students, is we have a hypothesis. A hypothesis is something that we posit. We don't know it to be true. So then we design an experiment to prove or disprove this hypothesis. Uh, once we've done that, we come up with a theory. We say, it looks like my experiment says that what I thought is true, what I thought is not true, and then someone else repeats it. And between us, we can confirm that it's true. Right? This scientific method allows us to develop new knowledges. Um, at the start of this period, the... Islamic world is the center of the world economically, right? It's easy for us to overlook this now because I think for uh, many of us, we have a view which is increasingly informed by colonialism and um, sometimes some other perspectives on Islam which are um, not based on an understanding of where the world was in 1600, based on some other things. Um, the Ottoman Empire under Suleiman the Magnificent was not only one of the largest geographically, but also multi-ethnic and most tolerant empires the world has ever seen. Um, their peak has already passed by the start of our time period, but this empire lasts until World War I, when it really crumbles, right? Um, so the Ottoman Empire is in what we would call today Turkey, um, but it is not just comprised of Turkish people. Um, it has this advanced system called a millet system, which uh, allows different groups to have some relative self-government as long as they pay sort of taxes and homage to the rulers. Um, Mughal India at the time, so the Mughal Empire is running India, the Mughal Empire continues running India on and off until 1857 after the... Um, Indian revolt. Um, in that time, the British start to move in and kind of exercise informal control until they start exercising formal control. But India alone is dominating about a quarter of the world's GDP. That's 
making a quarter of the world's stuff, having a quarter of the world's wealth, right? Um, GDP is gross domestic product. It's all the stuff that an economy makes. Um, India under the Mughal Empire isn't what one would call a, an extremely authoritarian empire. It has a central government, but also diverse local elites who are making local rules. Um, Indian shipbuilding, dom um, or rather British shipbuilding, dominated the globe, but 60% and 90% of British imports came from India. Right? Britain is importing spices, Britain is importing silks, um, things that they can't grow at home. Right? Um, here we have a video of Jared Diamond. Is this the one that people said didn't work? Um, I'll leave you guys to watch this on your own time, um, but this one works just fine for me. Uh, if you can't find it, it's the opening to Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. Um, and what Diamond is discussing in Guns, Germs, and Steel is... So if you're watching this on a recording, I would pause and watch this video first. Um, what Diamond is talking about is whether or not it was, or what rather, made it inherent that the West grew wealthy. Um, another way to phrase this is, was it pluck or luck that made the West grow rich? Was it human agency, good fortune, or some kind of geographic benefit that made the West the place where capitalism took off, industrialization began, and where wealth was accumulated, more or less from the 18th, 19th century onward. Um, why is it that we have one small part of the world which becomes economically and socially the centre of the world for such a long time? Um, Diamond obviously posits this three-part thesis, right? Guns, uh, that is to say military technology. Germs, that is to say exposure to a number of diseases which people in other parts of the world have not been exposed to. Um, and we're going to look at that later in the course. We're going to look at the Columbian Exchange and what these novel diseases do to people living in the Americas. Um, and steel, that is to say, industry and the use of industry. He posits that those three things mean that by the time we get to the end of our course, the West, which grows to include the Americas, or North America at least, I should say, um, has become sort of economically the centre of the world. Um, you don't have to watch all 18 parts, but watch the first part. And I'd love to hear your reactions to it. I'd love to know what you think. So here is the Ottoman Empire, right, um, at its peak. Um, under Suleiman the Magnificent, as you can see, it had grown. At this point, the center of the world is not here, right? These are provincial, these are feudal, these are agricultural economies. Where the money, the wealth, the splendor is, is in the east, right? And this changes over the course of our course. Um, so... One of the things that uh, the scientific monarchy undermines is this idea, King Louis, um, le tassez-moi. Le tassez-moi means the state is me, right? It, it sounds better in French, um, or I am the state. Um, and in this conception, the monarch is the nation. There is no political nation. He doesn't need support from anyone else. He is, in this case, France, and France is him. Being French means being loyal to him. So it's hard to make claims uh, to the monarch when the monarch is the country, right? You can't say this isn't the French thing to do because whatever he does is the French thing to do. Um, here are some examples that I've written up of things that the king could do, um, which showed that people believed that he had absolute divine right to rule. Um, divine, by the way, means from God. So what people believed at this time, or people had believed up to this time, I should say, is that the king had been appointed by God, specifically this person, and that God wanted him to be in charge, right? Um, people would come to Versailles to watch the king eating. It was this big, uh, this big ritual of the king's breakfast, is what it was called. Um, it was believed to be a great honor. It would bring you great fortune to watch the king eating his breakfast. So the king would eat at this table and people would file through his palace to watch him having breakfast and to see this amazing being who was sort of almost a demigod himself. 
And the other thing is scrofula. Scrofula or the king's pox is a skin condition. Uh, this is one particularly graphic illustration. Right? We can also see uh, the king there having his breakfast as people file on past, right? Um, so zooming in, I see on the scrofula. Uh, scrofula or king's pox was thought to only be curable if you were touched by the monarch, right? It plays into this idea of the king as uh, someone divinely ordained, someone with a direct relationship with God. And one of the things he could do was heal this. Um, however, the scientific revolution, along with changes in religious belief, which we see from the Huguenot, um, uh, begin to undermine this. And the kings have to come up with new ways of reinforcing their monarchy. And one of the things they do is they try and undermine the nobility, the nobility who are attacking them. And they build these tremendous palaces, right? So we see Versailles, and if anyone's been to Versailles, it's beautiful. If you haven't, uh, I suggest looking up some videos or pictures. It's this incredible palace which is built. If the idea of divinity isn't enough, there's almost this need to create a heaven on earth to show that the king is still powerful. Here is this what is called the Great Divergence, right? The Great Divergence is this divergence between the West and the rest, right? Between Western economic uh, industrialization and the East, which, as I remember, as I said, had been at the center of the world economy. So this is GDP, again, what a country makes per person uh, in 1990 constant dollars, right? So the same value. It's not like inflation could change it. Here we are at the start of our course, um, so we can see the Netherlands. The Netherlands has something of a monopoly on global trade because of their shipbuilding at this point. But look what happens here. At this point, these European economies start taking off, right? And they start moving faster and faster and faster and faster and faster as they grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. But these Eastern economies, uh, Japan is somewhat tied to Europe, uh, but these two, India and China, which had been producers of all the things that people wanted in the world, right? Tea and silk and spices. They had been some of the wealthiest countries. Never really, even as we are here in the early 2000s, they still haven't caught up, right? These countries which were once as wealthy, if not more wealthy, haven't caught up to the West. Um, and there are different theories on this. Um, some posit European exceptionism. Right, uh, the idea that Europe is different and special and better than the rest of the world. Landis is one of these, right? Um, he says that Europe has a unique culture, uh, a culture of capitalism and of the nation state. That is to say, uh, a nation is an imagined community. A nation is something that joins us together through space and time. Um, I've asked you to think about what a nation is. Um, what a nation is not, categorically, is the entity that creates passports, that has a military, that has a government, that has a flag. Those things are the state, right? The state is the government. The nation is something, an identity, which may or may not correlate with that government, right? We could say that um, California might be a nation outside of America, maybe. It's a tough one. Um, certainly Wales and Scotland and Great Britain are nations, right? Um, he argues that the unity of the nation and the state and this precocious capitalism, the European love for making money, are the things that make Europe diverge. Um, Frank says that uh, we should look at the entirety of the world economy. Uh, and there was a world economy a long time before there was an industrial economy. We talk about globalization, something that happened in the 80s and the 90s, but British people were eating food and wearing clothes from India before even the start of this period, right? We find artifacts from Egypt in Mesopotamia um, thousands of years before the common era, right? 6,000 years ago. Um, so there's been a world economy for a long time. And various parts of the world have been at the top of this economy at different points. Um, we just happen to be at a point at which the economy of Europe is at a peak. And this may be cyclical, right? It may go back and forth. And the last one is Wong. Um, Wong says 
they both developed unique responses to the issues facing them, but what Europe did was capture more.